Hey everybody, welcome to this June edition of Book Talk with Jordan and Stefan. Today we are taking a look at Scythe by Neil Schusterman. This, I will say out front, I went into this with very high hopes, uh, high hopes that were quite, quite fulfilled, uh, were very much fulfilled. Neil Schusterman is one of my favorite science fiction writers of modern times. Uh, I do not hesitate to put him on par with Orson Scott Card, with Philip K. Dick, and other such writers. Uh, what distinguishes Neil Schusterman, however, is that uh, he writes exclusively in the young adult market. This is interesting to me because we've seen recently, a since the advent of the age of Harry Potter, and uh, to a lesser extent, Hunger Games, Twilight, that kind of thing, we have seen a just huge surge in uh, teen fiction and young adult fiction that's actually really good, that actually delivers the goods. And uh, I don't know, I, I attribute it to Harry Potter kind of opening up that possibility, also opening up the market. It's now a transgenerational market. Um, but we seem to we seem to be in a world now where most of the adult science fiction is these very kind of hackneyed. Uh, I'm talking about the literary uh, science fiction market. Is these very kind of hackneyed, cliched sort of uh, goth stories or uh, maybe steampunk stories? Everything is freaking steampunk now, on and on ad nauseum, and playing to a lot of kind of very. Uh, base level science fiction tropes that we just see over and over again. The real, the real exciting stuff seems to be coming in the young adult market, uh, surprisingly. And uh, another great author that I would point out who's been around for a while is M. T. Anderson, who uh, is a satirist par excellence. Writes on the level I, I would say is a satirist on the level of Kurt Vonnegut, uh, and he is a young adult writer. You should check out his book Feeds. That's F E E D S. Uh, but coming back to Neil Schusterman, I first became aware of him when I read his book Unwind, which is a deeply disturbing, savagely satirical look at the uh, pro-choice, pro-life abortion divide where a, in a near future America, the uh, abortion has been made effectively illegal, but there's a compromise that's been reached where from conception through age 12, a child's life cannot be violated, but at age 12, the uh, child can be uh, retroactively aborted or unwound. And what they do is they, at that age, the, the organs can be transplanted. So they take all of the child's organs and everything else and bone and skin and all of their organic matter and put them in stasis so that life never actually stops, and then they can be implanted into uh, people who need uh, donated organs and whatnot. And that, that was one of the most just bone-chilling, blood-curdling, uh, white-knuckle, disturbing ideas I've ever read. It was fantastic. Blew me away. Uh, so much, it, it was so disturbing, though, that I actually have not had the nerve to tackle the next uh, three books in the Unwind uh, Distology, as they're called. I intend to do that now, however. But here, uh, today, we are going to be discussing Scythe. And Scythe is uh, a... It, 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 I will not hesitate to say... It hits all the right buttons. It works as a uh, it works as a dystopian future story, uh, a la Logan's Run, a la Rollerball, uh, a la The Hunger Games, uh, or I should say Battle Royale. It works as a uh, as a teen growing up story. It works as a piece of socio-political commentary it works as a thought experiment it is the this is the fascinating story of a world again a future america a future world i should say but set in america where immortality has been achieved not only has immortality been achieved but uh disease hunger and all matters of need have been wiped out nobody is wanting for anything and what has happened is that the result is that people live forever 
and their lives are ruled by a supercomputer, but this is not a tyrannical dictator like we would see in uh, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream or something like that. But this is actually a supercomputer that's gotten everything working perfectly and everybody's happy. But there is one exception. There is an organization, a, a sacred order of people known as the Scythes. And the Scythes, or the Scythedom as they're called collectively, are tasked with the job of killing, or as they call it, gleaning, killing uh, people at random to cull the herd to so that death does still occasionally occur uh, because otherwise they you know they go through their characters for example who uh, as a pass you know kill themselves in wild and dramatic ways just to be revived later as a pastime just to have something to do death has become a joke <coughs> so it's the pro it's the uh, province of the sites to kill and they have to kill a certain number of people every year and they have to kill them at a certain rate and they can't show bias they can't show malice they have to uh they have to just kill at random and they and uh they grant immunity they grant immunity to the families of the people they kill provided the person that they are killing does not resist and uh if the person uh if the person they're killing does not resist they will grant one year immunity to that person's friends and love uh family friends and loved ones and so into this premise, Schusterman tells us the story of two teenagers, Rowan and Citra, who are taken on as apprentices of Honorable Scythe Faraday, who, uh, you know, is very much our, our kind of Mr. Miyagi character in this story. But he is one of the old guard of the Scythes. He is one of the uh, ones who considers it to be a very honorable and sacred practice. He takes his job very seriously. And he is looking for a replacement. Only one of them can be his replacement. Uh, from there, we are taken into a world of uh, corruption and political intrigue inside of the, the order of the Scythes and how that works. And we find that this perfect system is, of course, far from perfect. Uh, Stefan and I will be discussing, we'll try to keep spoilers to a minimum, but we will have to, to fully discuss this idea, I'm sure we will have to elicit certain spoilers along the way. We'll try to uh, preface that with a spoiler alert as we go. So, that's enough of my uh, ongoing uh, babbling. Stefan, what did you think? This was actually one of the best uh, books of its kind that I've ever read. This is typically in the dystopian genre. I would put it more in the, I don't know if there's such a thing as a utopia genre, but uh, this is effectively what it is. And that one aspect of humanity trying to find a purpose, you know, always putting things off till tomorrow, because there's always tomorrow, you're, you're clinically immortal. That's the sort of attitude that is, uh, you know, the plight of the dispossessed. They don't know what to do, or they're not motivated enough, and everyone sort of has their needs required for them or given to them. Uh, the supercomputer takes care of everything and has achieved consciousness. It has, you know, achieved the singularity, but it can't hurt humanity. So it's sort of doing things in the background, but people need to die. And this is where the main problem of the story, as great as it is, as, as amazing as the writing is, I mean, this is really beyond Orson Scott Card. This is taking uh, a modern look at uh, technology, our theories about the future, and really saying, okay, what if we could do all these things how would we behave and why? Uh, so it, it does a lot of things very well and very quickly and very cleanly. And that's the, the one term, one descriptor I give to this story is there's no fat. There is absolutely zero fat I could find to the point where I wished there was. I wished the writer was not as good <laughs> as he was because I would like to see more. Now, this is the first of a series and it just came out at, what, a few months ago or so. So yeah. Yeah. so he's going to be doing more. And you, I will bet you any money he's going to just crush uh, you know, Ender's Game or whatever other uh, series that uh, Orson Scott Card has ever produced uh, for maturity and ideas and, and clarity. Uh, but it, it becomes the problem of, uh, you know, what is this setting? Why are they, ha why do they have to kill so much? Uh, and why is there a quota? Why are they allowing any scythe of a certain choosing to do whatever they want? Uh, you know, these sorts of questions pop up. And uh, I, you really want to know if that's the case, because when, when you think about it, there's there's a whole bunch of 
of uh, political issues in here that he just brings up. And yeah, if you're into talking about politics and what would a future world utopia be, how libertarian would it be? Uh, you know, he, he goes back and, and looks at, I wouldn't say he brings up Platonic ideas, but there's references to Plato and Aristotle and the names of certain characters. Like a Scythe has to name himself when he becomes one and they choose all these names. And I was, I was really uh, impressed that he knew one of the names of uh, one of Plato's followers. And, uh, you know, all these little, little nuances to, to government and what does it mean to, to be free and, and, you know, live forever and the, the culture of some of these peoples. Like they, that's what world building is. And, and I always harp how world building is a, is usually a waste of time and it, it sucks up your, your effort and your energy to read something well. And at this point, I'm like, you know what, this guy has created a world and, and characters that you care about. You, you now want to know more. So if he would just, just sort of, you know, put the throttle a little, little lower and, and, uh, you know, give us some color about the setting, the history, uh, you know, why the, the math he used of the, pers the, po the probability of you being killed was totally off in my mind. You know, all these little, little, little questions I have do not take away from the story, but you want them explained in further detail. And that's the makings of a great story. You have all these little questions like, well, what about that? It doesn't affect the plot. It doesn't affect the characters. It doesn't affect the setting or, or rather it does affect the setting, but that's all secondary. That's all you don't have to worry about that. But going into a sequel, you want to see more. You want to see more characters with all these little details that, that came up in your mind and, and can be personified in some way. So this is, I mean, once you read this, you will not put it down. Yeah. That's, that's how good this is. Yeah. And this is what's, you know, Stefan brought up a really good point about this, especially about the utopian aspect of it. That is there, that we know there's dystopian fiction. Is there such a thing as utopian fiction? And, it's one of those things where it is dystopian in a lot of ways, but it's not overtly dystopian. It's more in the vein of like Brave New World, where it's like on the surface, everything is going awesome. Every need is fulfilled. Everybody's having a great time. But there's this undercurrent of uh, uh, this, this undercurrent of a lack of fulfillment and a lack of um, passion and zest for life. And the, the thing that kept coming up, to me, uh, was interesting to me is there's no, you know, the scythes are all named after famous scientists and, uh, you know, famous scientists, famous philosophers, that kind of thing. So, of course, we have uh, Scythe Curie, who is uh, Madame Curie and uh, and all of this. And we have, it's funny, if you if you uh, notice one of the scythes that's just briefly mentioned is named Scythe Colbert. Um, but the, uh, um, <clears throat> the, the, the thing was the overarching philosophical theme. I was noticed it was interesting to me. There's no Scythe Nietzsche that I can recall, and I thought that was interesting because. And of course, I know everyone knows I'm a huge Nietzsche uh, fanatic, and you know you have a when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. But there is legitimately, I think, a Nietzschean element to this because Nietzsche argued that it is not uh, it is not um, peace. And uh, and safety and serenity, which brings out the best in us. It is in times of war and conflict and uh, and passion, and that's when you know that's when we have passion and intrigue, and that's when we have the opportunity to be bold and courageous and daring, and we have, and that's what really reveals who we are and what we are. And I think that, in a way, the scythedom, uh, and this is something that various characters ponder from different perspectives throughout the story the scythedom gives people that it is the it is the computer it is the the, the supercomputer is called the thunderhead and i think the thunderhead set up the scythedom which it has no control over by its own prerogative has no control over i think it set it up to be that c critical component of existence that you know the people in this world they're happy but it's just sort of a mild contentment. Everybody's just kind of, okay, all right. There's no, you know, mortality is what gives us the drive to say, I want to do this with my life. I want to accomplish this before I die. This is what matters. This is important. This makes me feel alive. That, and that's what the scythem is trying to, uh, in a way, philosophically, is trying to give people. And Scythe Faraday even makes that point overtly uh, early on in the story. 
What's interesting to me in that regard is how these sites, or how the, the two apprentice sites, uh, Citra and Rowan, uh, who are the two main characters, it's interesting how they develop because they develop two very interesting perspectives on what it means to be a scythe. And Rowan uh, becomes, I think, in a Nietzschean sense, he becomes fully ubermensch because the bad guys, I, I don't, again, I don't want to give too much away, the bad guys in this are a group of scythes named by Scythe, uh, led by Scythe Goddard. And Scythe Goddard's attitude is that the scythes are the masters and the everybody the more the the uh the the regular the proletariat the regular people they are all the underlings the slaves so we are masters and slaves and at first i thought he was setting up a dichotomy to do you know what is kind of the most common misreading of nietzsche where people think nietzsche is saying oh well you should be a master and beat up the slaves and be a bully no he's not saying that he's saying that once you once a decent you know, person experiences once someone in the slave, uh, someone that's perhaps in the slave category experiences existence as a master, they will realize that being able to just exert your will on people is not a fulfilling way to live, and they will evolve past that to a sense of personal morality, of, of personal good and compassion that is not predicated on gods and over, you know, overlords bearing down on you. That uh, you will just simply realize the right way to live, and things are, that there's a good, proper way to live that's good for you, that's good for everybody, and you will live that way, having transcended the master-slave relationship. Rowan is very much the character in this who is tempted by the dark side. He is tempted very much to follow in the tradition of Scythe Goddard, and comes very close to doing so. But in so doing he becomes fully ubermensch. He becomes, he transcends the master-slave dichotomy. And so that character was specifically, and people, anyone who reads the book with that perspective will know what I'm talking about by the end of it. That was, uh, that was one of the most exciting parts of this for me. Rowan and Citra are both great characters, and yes, there's this back-and-forth love story that goes on between them. But um, the uh, uh, and it's it's not it's not a fully evolved love story. This is obviously something that's going to develop throughout the entire series. But uh, Citra, on the other hand, is more of a uh, more of a character. She she's more about uh, less about the transcendence of the Ubermensch or transcendence to becoming the Ubermensch, and more about. I mean, she she could almost be seen as like an, an analogy for a a sort of Christian concept of death, of you know, of compassion and compassion for the suffering, and you know, lo, you know, love and compassion for the downtrodden and all that. And she follows that path, and you can tell that these two paths are going to intersect throughout the story. And knowing that he consciously developed these, obviously consciously developed these two characters so well where you've got basically the Christ and the Antichrist uh, in the Nietzschean concept that are going to be working for and, for and against each other throughout the, the series as it goes on, is just some of the most captivating writing. I mean, these are some of the best characters that I've ever seen. And I want to I hand it back over to Stefan to talk about the philosophical element of it a little bit as well. But to give you an idea of... I wanted, I, sp I, I picked out this passage specifically. Throughout the story, every chapter is bookended by a passage from the journals of one of the Scythe characters in the story. The Scythes are required to keep journals of their thoughts, which can be viewed, which are there for public viewing and public uh, review and all of that. And so uh, this, is a, this is a passage from Scythe Faraday. That just blew, when I read this, it blew my mind. Like I, I uh, shared this all over Facebook and Twitter and all of that. This passage: Immortality cannot temper the folly or frailty of youth. Innocence is doomed to die a senseless death at our own hands, a casualty of the mistakes we can never undo. So we lay to rest the wide-eyed wonder we once thrived upon, replacing it with scars of which we never speak. To knotted. 
too knotted for any amount of technology to repair. With each gleaning I commit, with each life taken for the good of humanity, I mourn the boy I once was, whose name I sometimes struggle to remember, and I long for a place beyond immortality where I can, in some small measure, resurrect the wonder and be that boy again. That is damn good writing. And that, I mean, that's why, that, that is part of why we just, I think we are just fascinated by this book. What did you think about the philosophical ramifications and what, what was your take on the overarching philosophical framework, Stefan? Uh, well, the philosophy is, is uh, varied because you, if you look at what Faraday is trying to say and what the, the old guard or whatever the old group of scythes were, you have to be compassionate, you have to be very considerate, uh, death is not a light thing. You are you have the power of it, so you have to treat it with respect, and that's what the two main char- or the two characters. And I, this is where I have to I have to stop and go back and say, well, you know what? There are bad guys in the story, but they're not antagonists in the traditional sense. Yeah. And when you look at romance stories, the protagonist and the antagonist are always going to be the uh, the male and the female, the, the person pursuing and being pursued and, and fighting yeah. them off their advances. So it has that mentality of where you don't, you're not sure who the bad person is, even though you see uh, uh, Rowan go down a certain path, but he still was taught under Faraday. So I, I, I go back then to the philosophy of what if Faraday is kind of like Socrates and he taught his two students and they went their own ways. And then I, I break that down and say, okay, well then maybe... Uh, Curie is kind of like Plato. She's idealistic of the old ways. Uh, but then if you go to uh, Rowan's path, you, you see how he came from Xenocrates. Uh, yeah. At least that's the, a student of Plato. And to look at it more uh, specifically, um, he would in the, in the story, Xenocrates is more like uh, Aristippus of Cyrene, and he was one of the hedonists who mm-hmm. believed in uh, you know, more is better. So he's, he's pictured as a big, fat man with gold trimming, and he's just this big, and he's the most important uh, scythe. So he's, you know, he's self-important, but he still lives in a humble sense, but he doesn't care, he doesn't mind flaunting it and showing off and whatever in mm-hmm. his own little way. And then his student is, is the, the, what you consider the bad guy, is just the same regarding that philosophy, only in a stronger sense. And that's where, you know, the, you get the literal interpretation of Nietzsche. So, yeah, there's all these interpretations of who's the bad guy. And then Curie is like, you know, the, the friend you, you grew up with or you were taught with is no longer that person. And, you know, there's, there's all this, there's literal conflict between these two where they actually fight each other. And w- she knows, Citra knows what kind of person Rowan is to a point. She doesn't know everything, but she knows the kind of man he is. And she knows he's going to do something that she just will drive her nuts because she happens to be a female or uh, he happens to be a male. So that sort of dichotomy of I want to do well, I want to prove to people I'm just as good. At the same same time, I don't want to lose myself to whatever they're training me because I'm becoming this this essentially an Ubermensch, as you referred to. Yeah. Uh, and then and then. Of course, uh, Curie's no, or not Curie, uh, Citra's no slouch either. So yeah. there's there's a there's the physical conflict there. There's the the, the philosophical conflict. The uh, the organization is just an organization. They have their own weird laws, and there, there's all these funny um, stories of uh, the outside world marketing death machines or or techniques to them, and they they all vote on it, and it's they come they come together every I think half a year or so. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much, how do you look at death? And then I, I think of people I know who are in the, uh, the undertaker business or in the, the, uh, being a, a caretaker of, of grief. And that's sort of the old guard. So that's the, the mentality of compassion and, and mm-hmm. caring for people and realizing that death is not this, this thing that, uh, you go about flaunting. And then there's the, the new people who are like, no, 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 we're, we have to meet a quota. We're going to enjoy it. We're going to be the best at it. It's going to be a bloodbath. This is, this is why we're alive. The hunter yeah. is, is the, the, the alpha and all that stuff. So it's, it's allowing humanity, a, a, allowing pretty much a psychopath, a group of psychopaths to be born. And mm-hmm. how do you deal with that? So when you read this uh, from a political sense, you're thinking, oh, wow, freedom, you can do whatever you want. I don't understand how this is a, a dystopia just because... 
you have all this time on your hands, and then you see uh, these people who can take your life away. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely against any sort of non-aggression principle or any sort of uh, mm -hmm. ethics that a... a uh, like, there is a court system in this in this uh, world, but it's always secondary to the size. So you give these people absolute power over death, and obviously, if that's not properly uh, given checks and balances, you are going to get some really, really scary bad apples. And uh, that's that's kind of a weird oversight. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm surprised that this uh, was allowed to happen because the Ten Commandments of the Scythes are pretty... Mm -hmm. They're pretty open ended. I mean, you could you could just become anyone. Yeah. Uh, and and so, when uh, when they're taught by Faraday, you you get a, a great feeling of who these characters are, and as they go their their alternate routes. Um, yeah, there is maybe one or two contrived scenarios that make them do things, but uh, you you understand where they're coming from very well. And mm -hmm. uh, I just wish there was more. Uh, there was more about the culture. There was more about that um, the religion within the the uh the society or the world society which is all about vibrations and mm -hmm. and resonance and uh uh you know they, they believe that 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 life is precious and there's all this wonderful uh <laughs> this weird analogy of of stale water just having all these microbes in it and this this is how life originated and this is the thing we're missing because we're now immortal and we have these yeah. nano machines in our body that uh, we we no longer should care about. So it, it's really about trying to understand this culture through the technology they're providing, and us uh, as readers going, how is how is this good? How is this bad? And why are these characters uh, thinking the way they are? Like the 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 other the bad parts, the other parts. They they're they're not flat characters. Everyone's rather rounded. Yeah. But the real the real antagonist and protagonist are the two main characters, and that's where you get to. That's what makes it to me a great story because you don't exactly know who the bad guy is. You don't exactly know who the good guy is. Citra always comes across as the the very uh, caring and compassionate person. Rowan yeah. is just as compassionate, but just because he's been trained a different way doesn't mean that their character is is going to be. Mm -hmm ever so different unless it is but that's that's really the only major mystery mm -hmm. of what's going to happen to these people so they have plenty of choices to make they have plenty of events yeah. um but yeah it's just it's just a stellar read you're just constantly going through it going wow they, they brought up plato or wow they they brought up this or that and uh for me as as someone who's who's read uh as much in, in this sort of genre as i can uh, it was it was new. It was this is a new thing, and that's why I'm, I'm really uh, mm -hmm. amazed of what the ideas this guy came up with. And and the, the ideas themselves, I think we can agree, aren't unheard of. Like we could yeah. all relate. Okay, there's the singularity. There's AI, but it's not a big deal. There's clinical immortality. You have nan nano machines. You have all these um, responding chambers or whatever they call them. You yeah. know, all these all these little things that. Uh, yeah, color the world, and you just wanted more. You wanted to know more. That's what I keep going back to. If the second story has more color, and maybe less character, I think we would be very happy to see yeah. this as an ongoing series. And this yeah. this could easily become the first book alone could be at least a twelve part miniseries on TV. Mm -hmm. It is and so I adaptable. Know, I know for a fact it's actually being prepared right now to be a feature film. So that's uh, that's going to be awesome. Um, and and I'm I'm looking forward to that. And of course I uh, of course I was imagining J Law playing uh, Citra, but uh, <laughs> I think she's probably aged out of that by now. And, and it's a little too on the nose. But um, the uh, but yeah, it 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 is a fascinating story. And uh, you brought you know I don't want to uh, get lost too much in the uh, philosophy of it since we're kind of on to the next topic. But you brought up a couple of things there. The theme of the old and the young, I think, is a strong conflict in this. And, you know, in, in teen fiction, in young adult fiction, some kind of conflict with your parents is kind of a staple of the genre, obviously, because teenagers are in conflict with their parents. And what happens, you know, in, 
in the blackened, murky abyss that was young adult fiction before Harry Potter, you know, you had a lot of stories about kids dealing with alcoholic parents or, you know, boys dealing with absentee fathers and how can I score the winning basket at the basketball game if my dad's not in the audience and all of that stuff, you know, and... Schusterman gets that. He incorporates an element of parental conflict into his stories, but he does it so cleanly and so smoothly that you don't think about it. You know, in Unwind, he's got, obviously, you have kids who are in conflict with their parents because their parents have uh, donated them to the state for um, uh, organ harvesting, you know, so it's a little more obvious. But in this one, the concept of the old young is more like a dialectic uh, concept here. This, you know, there's the old saying: if an old man is not, or if a young man is not liberal, he has no heart. If an old man is not conservative, he has no brain. And p- one of the themes here is the process of maturity of coming to understand uh, certain facets of uh, the establishment, the establishment mindset, which is the old guard of sites. Why do they do it this way? Why are they doing this and not? Uh, pursuing this, uh, you know, not not wild, the pursuing wild hedonism. Why are they so restrained and that kind of thing? That or why is that the intention? That sort of thing is uh, uh, was was a just a fascinating perspective on it to me. The next thing that I thought was interesting, you brought up the Ten Commandments of the Scythes, which are um, the first uh, the first four are written on the back of the uh, book. So I'll read them off right quick. Thou shalt kill. Thou shalt kill with no bias, bigotry, or malice aforethought. Thou shalt grant an anim of immunity to the beloved of those who accept your coming. Thou shalt kill the beloved of those who resist. And it goes on from there. There's other rules that they have to live by. But it's to me, it struck me as kind of like the three laws of robotics in, in Asimov's writing, where it's like those three laws sound like absolutes that on the surface they sound like absolutes, but we start to see all of this nuance and all of these different angles. And one of the things that I, <clears throat> you talk about exploring the implications of the world, and he definitely does that in this book. I mean, there is really no point in this book where he's not exploring the implications of what it would mean to live, live in this society. One of my favorite little moments is when the uh, Citra and Rowan are going um uh, grocery shopping with Faraday, and some guy runs up. See, to to grant immunity, the sites make you kiss their ring. You kiss their ring. Your DNA encodes on the uh, on their internal database, and uh, you are protected from uh, from gleaning from being killed for one year. So while they're in the grocery store, this guy and <clears throat> in the checkout line, this guy runs up to Faraday, grabs his hand, and kisses his ring, and says, "Ha! You can't touch me for three hundred sixty five days." And uh, Faraday says. And I'll be seeing you on day three sixty six, and uh, and I, I love that. That was my one of my favorite uh, moments. And Citra says, "Are you really going to go kill him?" And he says, "Well, no, but he's going to spend a year suffering thinking about it anyway, so that's good enough." And uh, <clears throat> uh, and so that that was really cool. The only thing you're right, this is very original. The only thing similar, the only similar book I can think of was uh, the Post Mortal by Drew McGarry which also explored the idea of what would it mean for society if we lived in uh, a world of immortals, if we no longer uh, were, you know, if we were no longer mortal, nobody dies, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and he came to basically the same conclusion that we would need people whose job it was to call the herd, but in his mind that was purely for the sake of uh, population control, not because of... Uh, really any other outside forces or larger philosophical forces. It just was it was just like a doomsday scenario of now we've got too many people. Uh, you know, make make room, make room, which became the movie uh Soylent Green was very much in the same kind of vein, which was it was just like, well, population becomes the issue. So <clears throat> that's probably overpop- that's probably the the biggest failing of the setting is that we don't know what the big deal is with birth control. We don't know what exactly is the population limit like this is I, I i talked to you about this uh when we first started reading this about how it reminded me of two episodes of star trek how there's a, an episode of star trek where there's this planet which is just literally crammed like every surface area of this planet is crammed with people and they love life so they they would never think of of dying or, or hurting anyone and in this uh, story we don't really get a sense of how crowded it is and it doesn't seem that crowded 
Mm-hmm. So there, there had to have been some sort of bad thing that yeah. happened to say, okay, the only fault we've got here is overpopulation. Yeah. We, we should take steps. So they make the scythem. Okay, fine. That, that will actually eliminate people. Great. Yeah. But what's the, what's the stable number? What's the, the threshold that you have to be, war, have to be careful of? What's, the, what's yeah. the birth rate in a certain country? What's the, are you making new additional land masses? Are, are you able to do that? And why not? Yeah. Um, so it, it, that's sort of, you know, once, once humanity sees a problem, especially on a global level, I would imagine we would come together and try and solve that. And the only other answer I could see why they don't in this story is that because they're so dispossessed, they have, mm-hmm. they have no concern for what's going on, that that sort of curtails into every aspect of their being. You could sort of see that with the side characters, with their family members who don't really care so much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all, all the sort of things that they, it's a, everyone sort of has that opinion, which I was kind of sad by because I, I wanted some characters who are actually like, this life is amazing, aside from uh, the scythes themselves, because that's one of their, their tenets is to be like, you know, thou shalt lead into an exemplary life. And then the mm-hmm. one guy takes it as far as he can go being a scythe, which you can imagine what that means. Yeah. So uh, that is, you know, the only other character I saw that actually enjoyed in, in this world and, and loved it so much that they, they wanted to keep doing it or they had some passion so that's that's kind of I I wanted to get a sense of how that came about. It's a basic psychological aspect of what motivates you and why, and it, there has to be a very very good reason why every single person on the planet who's not a scythe has this sort of attitude. And I wanted to really explore that um, outside of the scythe. And the only way we really got to see anything like that, aside from the kids running around and having fun, uh, or or grandmothers you know, regressing back to you know being younger than their children uh, was uh, with this this religious cult that actually had a meaning in life because they, they invented it. So uh, that's cool. That's interesting. That's what religion does. Yeah. And well, that, uh, yeah. And that goes back to, I mean, that 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 uh, in in the religion there's there, what Stefan's referring to. There's a, re- a religion called the Tonists, and their uh, their religion basically it's the only the only world religion that still exists because most no one most people don't need religion since they're immortal and um the uh and the the tonists worship hence the name they worship the tones given off by tuning forks and that's their you know they they have this uh the concept that vibration brings harmony to all of existence and all of that and uh that they were interesting to me because you're right. They invented an arbitrary, consciously invented an arbitrary religion to give their lives meaning. And I think to me that's what I to, to me bringing up another philosopher, <laughs> which I was almost thinking if I if I I kept thinking like if I'm a scythe, what would my scythe name be? And I kind of would want to be Scythe Camus, but uh, the uh, except everyone would be calling me Scythe Camus, and that would piss me off, and they'd all get gleaned. But uh, <laughs> The uh, but actually no they wouldn't because I the Ten Commandments say I can't glean with malice aforethought so never mind but the um, uh, <laughs> but anyway Albert Camus had the theory of absurd had his theory of absurdism that he said that uh, you know people will realize all, all human beings will realize at some point that life is fundamentally meaningless. And, uh, you know, if you want to see a brilliant, uh, a brilliant exploration of this idea, just watch BoJack Horseman. But <laughs> in the meantime, so, uh, you know, the scythes are a great idea, a great example of this, or the book scythe is a great example of this, because Camus argued that upon realizing that life is fundamentally meaningless, all people will go, will go down one of three paths. One, they will commit suicide. Two, they will discover religion. Or three... They will transcend and start living for their own, you know, their own sake and their own happiness, and realize that their own happiness is their own purpose because they realize that life is fundamentally absurd. And I feel like that's almost what uh, uh, that's a larger philosophical argument that Schusterman is trying to make in this because. Uh, for most people, most people are, you know, they're again bringing around the Nietzsche metaphor. There is like a God is dead element to this. You know, when Nietzsche said God is dead, what he meant was that, you know, we suddenly, we are now in a world 
uh, where science and technology and everything else is making the need for God irrelevant in our our lives, and now everybody's running around panicked because they suddenly don't have a focusing point for their lives anymore. God is dead, and uh, metaphorically dead. Uh, and so, really, that's what we see. We see this moment of absurdism happening in the society at large that um, the uh, Scythe Curie notes in one of her uh, journal entries that immortality has turned people into cartoon characters because now you have people who are jumping off buildings for just for the hell of it just to be revived they're jumping off buildings and stepping in front of trains and all of the stuff to uh, experience some vague thrill of being alive uh, by killing themselves and she says immortality has turned us all into cartoon characters and mentions the Looney Tunes and Wile E. Coyote and all of that that that's what we've become and so that's what we're seeing in this world, is a world of absurdity. And uh, what, what's interesting, one of the things that's interesting is the people that get gleaned in this story, whenever, when they are approached by the scythe and they're about to be killed, they're about to be gleaned, they always have this uh, overwhelming realization of, oh my God, I've wasted my life, I've wasted my time, you know, if only I had done things differently. And so I think there's definitely an element of that. The other thing that's uh, fascinating to me, and then we'll wrap this up, because I know we could talk about this this one for hours, but one line that's fascinating to me, one one um, side-by-side -side that happens in the story that's just fascinating to me, is in the training of the scythes, where at one point uh, Rowan is told by Scythe Faraday that you have to have love and compassion in your heart. You have to reach out compassionately to the families of the people you kill. Otherwise, you're just a killing machine. Then, later in the story, uh, Goddard says to Rowan, Scythe Goddard says to Rowan, that you have to love killing. You have to be so just immersed in your bloodlust and just have this raging murder hard on and love killing and slaughtering and the, the act of killing and all of that. And then he says, because otherwise you're just a killing machine. And I love that because it's, two, it's these two conflicted perspectives on what it means to be human, on what it means to be alive, on what it means to understand and appreciate mortality. You could get into the concept of death denial, you know, the idea that uh, people who kill do so to try to gain a kill pathologically serial killers and that kind of thing, which is essentially what the scythes are, that they do that to gain a sense of dominance over death and that kind of thing. So many great ideas in this, and uh, you know, so many that we could go well beyond our forty-minute time slot. So, uh, Stefan, I think I can say for both of us, this is a book we would definitely recommend. Oh, you got to hold on to this. Buy this. Uh, you know, always refer to it um, yeah. as a. I would say refer to it as a the way writing should be, and I say that in the, the simplest way because uh, brevity. Uh, of what, how this, the style and structure of this is so, so clean that you can derive understanding of how to do your own stories and, and why it works. Yeah. I wouldn't say the pacing is, is as good as it could be, but because it's so clean, it goes along at a certain pace that is comfortable and you can get into and you can drop it and you know it. Oh, I remember reading that. Boom. Exactly. You, 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 mm -hmm. you're not lost in lore. You're not lost in setting. You're not lost in characters. Um, they have this sort of uh, mythic appeal. All the scythe, they're all sort of, uh, you know, high, holy, not holier than thou, but sort of larger than life mm -hmm. in their own mentality. I mean, there's a scythe Rand. There's, there's yep. all these names that you would scythe Chomsky. Yeah, you would recognize all these names. I know that guy. I know what he looks like. Blah blah blah. So it, it you really come back to it very easily, and uh, it's it's a it's a universe worth reading. It's it's a universe going back to, and I can't wait till we see more. It's really that yep. good. It's so good. It is so good. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to um, Book Talk with Jordan and Stefan. Uh, join us next time when our book will be Men Without Women by Haruki Murakami. I'm personally very excited about that one. So for Stefan Iorio, I am Jordan Owen. If you enjoy the series, please uh, consider contributing to its ongoing production at uh, patreon.com slash jordanowen42, and we will see you next time.